well, would you turn with me to 327 in your hymnal? Did I get one? 327, Springs of Living Water. I thirsted in the barren land of sin and shame. Would you stand with me as we sing? 327 on that first together. I thirsted in the barren land of sin. singing this morning. Welcome to the morning service. Good to see you today. Uh, let's see. We want to have prayer this morning. Uh, first of all, we want to praise the Lord. Taylor's our grandparents again. Uh, Josiah and Kate welcomed Elias James into the world. Uh, yesterday morning, about five till nine in the morning, seven pounds, 12 ounces, 20 inches long. And uh, that's grandchild number 10. And uh, how about that? So uh, praise the Lord, rejoice with that, and then re let's pray this morning when we open in prayer for the uh, Cheryl Polabel and her family, her sister, Leila, uh, went home to be with the Lord uh, yesterday, and uh, ushered into the arms of her Savior, and uh, absent from the body, and present with the Lord, but it's, uh, death is still separation, and uh, it's, we're separated from our loved ones, and uh, that's not easy. Uh, we need God's grace, and he promises his grace. And so pray for the family. Uh, pray for Cheryl. That's her sister. And uh, that God's grace will be upon uh, them. And uh, we'll, we'll let church family know the arrangements as uh, they become available to us. All right? Let's open in prayer together, shall we? Heavenly Father, we bow before you now today. We thank you, Lord, for another opportunity that's ours to gather together here in the house of God. Lord, thank you for each one that's made their way out this morning to the church services and Lord, we bow before you here at the beginning, and Lord, we do pray for the Paul Labels and uh, Leila's family and Cheryl and others, Lord, as they uh, mourn and grieve the loss of their loved one, but yet, Lord, we, we sorrow, but not as those who have no hope, and we thank you for the wonderful salvation that you provided through Jesus Christ, and we're thankful for the promise that one day we'll be reunited with loved ones in heaven. And Father, I pray that you would strengthen the family now and great grace would be upon them. Thank you for the new arrival in uh, uh, Josiah and Kate's household and uh, Taylor's grandchildren. Lord, thank you for the fruit of the womb as your reward. And Father, I pray now that you'll bless our service here this morning. May you control everything that's said and done. May it be for your honor and for your glory. May Christ be lifted up today and may all men be drawn unto him. It's in his name we ask it. Amen. All right, you may be seated. Needing strength for my journey, I knelt at the cross where Jesus once died for me. And I asked, is this the place 
285 in your hymnal 285 what a fellowship what a joy divine leaning on the everlasting arms 285 let's sing that first and last together on that first what a fellowship what a joy Now we have a few announcements for you. Listen carefully, if you will. Our uh, schedule this evening, 530, is our Christian growth class. We meet in the conference room down just across from the nursery. Our lesson tonight will be on stewardship. Stewardship. Uh, and we'll think that will be a help and a blessing to you. What, is God, how does, what does God say about handling uh, the finances that he gives us? And uh, what's his plan? God has a plan. And we'll teach you about that this evening, 5.30 in our Christian growth class. Now tonight at 6.30, we'll have the tour group from Commonwealth Baptist College in Lexington, Kentucky. And uh, they're always a blessing to us. They've come for several years. We look forward to having them with us in our service tonight. Uh, you will enjoy uh, them. They're, I think, a girls uh, trio that's singing. And uh, they'll be a great blessing. And uh, afterwards, we'll have ice cream and fellowship. And uh, so don't miss out on tonight, okay? And uh, be here and, and enjoy that service together with us this evening, all right? And then I also want to just remind everybody, next Sunday will be our uh, August the 2nd. We have our Give God the Glory offering. It's going to be to get the ladies' restroom renovated, all right? Uh, we'd like to get that finished and uh, ready for uh, anniversary weekend, which is August 16th. So uh, ask the Lord what he'd have you do for that special offering next Sunday that we can get that accomplished. All right, we got the, I think we have the fellows ready to go to work on it. Just want to have the funds to be able to get what we need, and uh, they'll get that transformed within a week or two time and uh, ready to go for you ladies, all right? And all the ladies said, amen, amen. yes, and uh, good idea. Okay. 
All right, that's what I have for this morning. Let's take a moment. We'll welcome any guests that are with us in the service today. We're always pleased when uh, folks visit with us in the service. Anybody here today for the first time? Uh, would you honor us right, right back here? This is uh, Tom, if I remember right. And uh, Tom's one of the radio listeners and uh, stopped in to see uh, to see it in person, I guess. And he found out I got a better face for radio. Amen. But uh, <laughs> good to see you this morning, Tom. Thank you for stopping in. Appreciate that. And uh, good to see John and Holly here this morning and uh, up from Toledo. And uh, glad they're here. She's the shy one on the right. And um, it's good to have you guys in the service today. God bless you. That's great. And uh, that's good. All right. Anyone else this morning? If you'll take just a moment and fill out the card, we'd appreciate that. In a little bit, we have an offering. You just put that card in the plate as it goes by and keep the pen as our gift to you for coming. We're glad you're here this morning. Let's give them all a warm welcome, shall we? Ten in your hymnal, five one zero, please. Whosoever meaneth me, I am happy today. And the sun shines bright; the clouds have been rolled away. <clears throat> On that first together, I am happy today. And the sun shines bright; the clouds have been rolled away. For the Savior said, "Whosoever." Let's 
turn and uh, turn to number 507. We're going to sing, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. And if you would, stand with me as we uh, sing that first verse of Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. We're going to have the children dismissed to junior church. On that first together, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Tune my heart to sing thy praise. Strings of mercy never ceasing. Call for songs of loudest praise. In me some melodious sonnet, sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the mount I'm fixed upon it. Mount of thy redeeming love. Here I raise mine Ebenezer, ever by thy help I come, and I hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God, he to rescue me from danger, interposed his precious blood. Amen. Greet one another. Make somebody feel welcome, especially our guests. We'll come back and sing that last stanza together. Come thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet, sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the mount, I'm fixed upon it. Mount of thy redeeming love. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor daily I'm constrained to be. Let's sing that last together. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to live the God I love. Here's my heart, oh, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. All right, good singing. You can be seated. 
Ushers are coming. We'll get our offering for this morning. Give as God has blessed and prospered you. All right. And if you're the last one seated, you put an extra hundred dollars in the plate. <laughs> Boy, that'll get them down quick, won't it? They'll, pew, they'll just hit the deck. All right. All right, let's pray for the offering today. Father, thank you for the privilege that's ours to give. Lord, I pray you'll bless the offering today. You'll meet the needs of your church through the giving of the people of God. And Lord, I, I do pray today for some preacher friends. We pray for Pastor Sexton. You'll put your healing hand upon him, Lord, and you, you'll strengthen him and spare his life at this time. We pray for Brother Bobby Robertson. He's said goodbye to his wife of 66 years. God strengthen him today and be with that, that church as they continue on for thee. Thank you for these men of God. Pray your grace and your strength to be with them today. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Take your Bible this morning for our scripture reading, if you would, please, to John 17, the Gospel of John in chapter 17. We're going to read the first 10 verses of John chapter 17. And we read these verses responsively. We'll begin together on verse 1, then I'll read 2, and we'll alternate like that until we read through verse number 10 of John 17. And as our custom is, let's stand together to read the scripture. All of us standing please to read God's word and let's begin together on verse 1 of John 17. Ready? These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come, glorify thy son, that thy son also may glorify thee. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. 
For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came out from them, and they have believed that thou didst send me. I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. And let's read 10 together also. And all are mine, are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. And let's pray together, shall we? Father, add your blessing now to the reading of the Scripture here this morning. And I pray, Lord, you would help each of us to be focused today as we prepare to listen to the Word of God. Lord, I pray you'll bless the special that Uh, each of our hearts and our minds would be focused and fixed upon you that we would have ears to hear what the spirit would say to each of our hearts this morning and i'll thank you for that i pray in jesus name amen all is still Heaven is silent as a mighty judge ascends the throne. The book of life is open and countless souls begin to moan. From the throne comes a voice like thunder. And this book are the souls my blood has bought. Faces turn as into the courtroom comes a very seed of sin. He who was the saint's accuser must face the charges against him with the fury of all the ages that demon voice begins to cry it's not fair I almost had you on Golgotha I watch you die then Satan begins to tremble as his fate to him was known from the throne came the verdict the lake of fire will be your home and i see every knee bowing every hand in honor is raised every voice to him Stand ye at attention as the redeemed began to sing. Heaven's chords resound their anthem. You are our Savior, Lord and King. Heaven's chords resound their anthem. Our Heavenly Father, we bow before you now in prayer. We thank you, Lord, that you truly are worthy of all of our praise and all of the glory and all of the honor that is due unto you. Lord, I pray that you'd be honored today and you'd be lifted up as we open up your word this morning and we look at the prayer you prayed in John 17. And I pray, Lord, you would help each of us now to give your word our undivided attention. Thank you for the Bible. Thank you, Lord, for giving us your words. And may we give them the respect and the attention that they deserve this morning. Please keep our minds from wondering. 
And Lord, help us to be focused on what you would want to say to each of us today. May holy decisions be made in the hearts of people this morning. In Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. John 17, if your Bible's open there, is really the true Lord's Prayer. I know sometimes we think about our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. That's uh, been called or termed the Lord's Prayer. It's really more of a model prayer, a, a, an example prayer for us. But this is the true prayer that I believe Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane before He went to Calvary. And uh, He received peace uh, as He went through this prayer and poured His heart out to God. You know, there's a lot of people in search of peace in this day and age. Um, you, not only do nations want peace, uh, countries want peace, the church wants peace, the family wants peace, individuals want peace. Everybody would like to have peace in their life. In fact, so much to so, uh, even when somebody dies, we say, may they rest in peace. We think maybe finally now they'll have peace. I read about a man who owned a business with many different locations, and he was opening a new location, and people were sending notes and gifts and flowers congratulating him on his expansion of his business. One day he arrived at work and there was a big beautiful wreath waiting for him at the door. And it said across the banner of the wreath, rest in peace. He was a little puzzled and he figured the florist must have made a mistake. So he called to complain to the florist and explained it and, and, and the florist could tell he was pretty angry and the florist said, just, just settle down, sir. Settle down. He said, look on the bright side. Somewhere today, a man is being buried and his flowers say, good luck in your new location. <laughs> so, you know, the Bible says Jesus made peace for us through the death of his cross. Jesus made peace, Colossians 1.20, through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. You know, John, as you get into the last, book, last half of the book of John, there's a lot of anxiety. Because Jesus is preparing His disciples for His departure. And this is a very difficult time for the disciples. And Jesus trying to get them to understand and really prepare them to take the gospel to the world when He goes. And it's very difficult because he's dealing with uh, 12 very proud men. All right? Uh, you remember, say, so how do you know they were proud? Remember they had an argument about who'd be the greatest? Huh. They were having arguments about who's going to sit the right hand and the left hand of Jesus. Uh, they, 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 when they got to the upper room waiting on Jesus, they were all there. The, remember, the, they, they were sitting down waiting for Jesus, and, and the basin of water was there, and the towels were there. But do you think any of them would get up and wash anybody's feet? Huh, you kidding me? Not wash anybody's feet. So what did Jesus do? Jesus got up, he put the towel around himself, and he washed their feet. What was he doing? Trying to teach them something about humility. Trying to teach them to be humble enough to serve other people. To, you, you really lead by serving. You understand, you can be too proud for God to use. You can never be too humble for God to use. God resists the proud. He gives grace to the humble. Prideful. They needed the lesson in humility. But you understand, they struggled with Christ telling them He was going to die. They, they thought He was the Messiah. They thought He would come and deliver them from Roman oppression. So this was their opportunity to be free and out from underneath Roman rule. But then they begin to find out as time unfolded that God had a different plan. And, and that God's plan wasn't their plan. You ever been there? <laughs> when you found out your plan wasn't God's plan? That He had a different plan? And by the way, God's plan is much better than their plan. But they had a difficult time understanding it. And by the way, don't be too hard on them. We have a different vantage point. We know, we, we, we can read, and we have the old, and we have the new, and we can tell why Jesus came. We know that He came for the cross. And we know that He came to be the Redeemer. 
And we know that He came to be the Savior. We know also, because we've got the rest of the book, that He's coming back again. And He's coming back not, to, not with a cross, but with a crown. And He's coming back not as, uh, as, the, uh, as a Redeemer, but as a ruler uh, to rule and reign on this earth. So we understand that. We have that vantage point. They didn't have that yet. And so I understand. They'd left everything. Their home, their family, their careers. And to top it all off, now, they know, now He tells them, I'm going to die. And then to top that off, He says, by the way, you're going to die too. Oh, isn't that great? I forsook everything. I've come to follow you thinking this is it. We're going to be freed from Roman oppression. And now you tell me you're going to be suffered. You're going to be beaten like nobody ever was beaten. And you're going to be crucified on a cross. You're going to die. And then you're telling us because they've hated you and they've crucified you, they're going to hate us and they're going to kill us. I'd like to see some of the prosperity preachers take that and preach on it for a while. How God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Yeah, tell that to John the Baptist. It was rough. You see, the disciples were not just a band of merry men like Robin Hood's men frolicking through the hills of Judea following Jesus. They're under more stress and they're about to suffer more loss than most of us could imagine. Here they are out on a limb for Jesus, so to speak, and the limb's getting sawed off. They're not quite sure what to do. But as we know from our Sunday school lesson this morning in Jesus' prayer in the garden, Jesus is under intense pressure as well as He feels the weight of sin and the load of, uh, of sin being put upon Himself. But think about the life that Jesus had to take when He, when he came to earth. Think about Him taking on human flesh. God in human flesh. As hard as that is for our minds to comprehend, uh, think, about, think about Him coming and, and, and constantly being misunderstood. Constantly being misquoted. Constantly being misrepresented. Constantly having your words twisted to something else. He had never had to deal with anything like that. And He deals with that on earth. In fact, remember, they didn't want to believe he was even born of a virgin. We be not born of fornication. That's what the Pharisees told him, implying that you were. You see, they, they were basically saying, you're illegitimate. And by the way, there's no illegitimate children. There are some illegitimate parents, amen? Jesus lived under that cloud. He lived under that accusation, and it followed him every day. They never completely understood what he said. He was, they called him a drunkard and a blasphemer. You ever been misunderstood? You ever sincerely tried to help somebody and they ended up hurting you? Ended up turning on you? You ever had your good, evil spoken of? You're, if you, you think you have, can I, can I just assure you that if you ever decide to uh, be a preacher or a pastor, <laughs> you'll find out that, you know what, you know what happens? You, you use, I, I never, the other day, uh, you'll read a letter Wednesday night from Brother John Hamilton. He was out helping a church plant out west, and he said we, I, I can't remember the exact number, 25,000 or 29,550 steps out soul winning, you know, getting the church planted. And he got some kind of technology that tells every step you take. You know what I mean? I, I don't know if they have anything that measures how many words you speak. But preachers say a lot of words. Okay? Don't thank you for not saying amen to that. And, um, and, and you know, you, you, you can't say as many words as a pastor says without at some time something not so intelligent coming out. And in the multitude of words, the Bible says there wanteth not sin. When you preach and you counsel and you make calls and you make visits and, and you, some, uh, the odds are not in your favor, not at some time saying something that you shouldn't say. Kind of like, it, it's not easy to be misunderstood. 
when they saw the miracles that Jesus did, and He did it. By the way, when they saw the miracles He did, they even accused Him of doing those miracles in the power of Satan. This is talk about misunderstood. Talk about uh, being attacked. He didn't get any respect. And then He faces the pressure of the cross and our sins being put upon Him, the torture. And in His humanity, He doesn't look forward to that. But He knows that He came to be the sacrifice for the world. You see, every lustful look, every murder, every lie, ever committed by every person that has ever lived. Every sin was laid on Jesus Christ. You and I cannot begin to imagine what that felt like or what that must have been like. And then have God pour His wrath upon that sin, punishing that sin. All the wickedness of all time condensed onto one person. In His sight, so grotesque, the Bible says we would not have been able to tell that He was a human being. And God the Father turning His back on His only Son as He died on the cross. Separating Himself from Him because of our sin. And Christ died for you and for me. But there's more pressures. Time constraints. So much to do in so little time. You ever felt that way? So much to do in so little time to get it done? You know, pastoring's like that. The moment you get a, get a message, preach Sunday morning, you preach Sunday night, and Sunday night's over, and guess what? Wednesday's coming. And Wednesday's done, and guess what? Sunday's coming. And, and you have to have Sunday morning and Sunday night and Wednesday night and, and get those messages ready week after week after week after week and it just starts over every time. And, you've gotta, and you want it to be, listen, you want it to be fresh. You don't want it to be, you don't want to get out. Hey, you, you don't, you don't want to have to get the you know, 30-day-old bread or the seven-year-old bread out. Uh, that's kind of old and crusty and moldy and, and you want it to be fresh bread, amen? And it's got to be somewhat interesting and uh, helpful some, some, uh, for the new Christian, maybe some for the old Christian, challenging and yet encouraging, interesting and yet informative. Heard the one day a visitor walked into the deacon's meeting on a Sunday afternoon. And the pastor looked at him. said, what are you doing here? And the guy said, well, you announced this morning there would be a meeting of the board, and I was about as bored as you could be. And he showed up at the deacon's meeting. I hope that's not you. You understand, pressure, and especially time pressure, is because we live in time. Now understand, this was an adjustment for Christ as well. You understand, in eternity, there's no time. God operates outside the realm of time. That's hard for us to, to fit into our brains because we're so consumed with time. What time does this start? What time is it over? What time do I have to be there tonight? What time do I got to be there tomorrow? What time is work? What time are you coming over? What time do we eat? What time am I going to bed? What time are we getting up? And it's time, 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 time. Imagine the adjustment that was for Jesus Christ just to come into time and be ruled by time. For three years now, he's trying to prepare his disciples for his death on the cross. How troubling it must have been when he gets to John 14 and he's telling them, I'm going to go away and prepare a place for you. And, and Philip looks at him and says, just show us the Father and we'll be satisfied. And Jesus looks at him like, Philip, have I been so long with you and you don't know who I am? It's like three years. You know, it'd be like you're teaching your kid for three years what two plus two is. And at the end of three years, he says, by the way, can I just ask you a question? Sure, what do you got? What's two plus two? It looked like, 
I just wasted three years of my life. Don't you understand? This is what Jesus was working with. Jesus, when he warned them of the leaven of the Pharisees, they thought, well, it's because he's mad because we forgot to take some bread. Jesus, they have an unbelievable long suffering with these disciples. And he's looking at these 12 thinking, I'm going to leave the hope of the world in the hands of these guys. It had to be pretty discouraging. It had to be pretty stressful. Now, how did he handle the pressure? What I want to talk to you this morning, and that was the introduction. Uh, how, how do you handle the pressure? How do you handle stress? Hey, Jesus are, is our example in everything. Amen? He is who we follow. So how did he handle it? Well, let's see what it says. Number one, he went to God first. That's what John 17 is. All of John 17 is Jesus praying to God. It's His prayer in the garden, I believe. And He's pouring His heart out to God, and He is God. And prayer, when you're under pressure, when you're in a stressful situation, prayer ought to be our first instinct, not our last resort. I mean, how many times have you heard somebody say, well, I guess we'll have to pray. Haven't you heard that? I've heard people say it. Well, I guess, I guess it comes down, we just got to pray. We just got to pray? That would be the first reaction that we have. That we have to go to God. We have to cast all our care upon Him, for He cares for us. And we take everything to Him in prayer. Now, God, God is concerned about everything. He knows, hey, he knows everything, and He knows what's going on in the world. He knows what's going on in the Middle East. He knows what's going on uh, in, in, in the countries that are dealing with ISIS and the persecution of Christians, and He knows what's going on in once was once a Christian America, but is no longer. But more than that, God's concerned, and God knows about you personally. The Bible says he even knows, he even counts the hairs on your head. For some he still adds, for others he subtracts. But he still knows the hairs on your head. So he cares about the little things. We live in a vast universe of billions of galaxies and billions of stars. But the only life is here on earth. You notice I didn't say intelligent. The only life is here on earth. Eve means mother of all living. The world says, if there's no life anywhere, anywhere in that massive expanse, then why did God go to all that trouble? You know what God says? What trouble? I spoke and they came into existence. It was no big deal for God. He knows. If, listen, if he can manage star systems, planets, gravitational forces, orbits, you think he can handle your problem and my problem? In fact, we're the only planet he's personally visited. He came here and lived. He cares about you and me. Sometimes you hear people say, well, I don't want to bother God with the little stuff. I just want to give God the big stuff. And God says, what's big stuff? What's big stuff? With big to us, but it's not big to God. It's not hard for Him. You know, children will pray to God about anything and everything. They have such wonderful prayers. One child prayed, I really want this new pink bicycle, God. I never have asked you for anything before. You can look it up. She said, dear, and another child prayed, Dear God, I read the Bible, but what does beget mean? Nobody will tell me. <laughs> dear God, she prayed, is it true that my dad won't get into heaven if he uses his golf words in the house? 
Mm. Dear God, I bet it's hard for you to love everybody in the whole world. There's only four people in my house and I could never do it. And this boy prayed, Dear God, please send Dennis Clark to a different summer camp this year. <laughs> you see, what, what, what is that saying? Kids believe God cares about those things. That, that He's concerned about their puppy dog. Or He's concerned about their favorite toy. Or whatever it is that concerns them. And, and God cares about the little things. Cast all your care upon Him. Because He cares about you. They're not unimportant to Him because you're not unimportant to Him. And because you're important to Him, then those things become important to Him. What keeps us from casting all our care upon God? What keeps us from going to God and asking God to take care of everything? Not just big things, little things. You know what it is? Huh? Pride. I, I, can, I can handle this. I got this. Remember, some of you have kids at that age and you see them struggling with something and you're wanting them to ask you to help them and, and no, they're, they're going to do it themselves. Pride. I won't ask anybody to help me. I'm going to do it myself. But First Peter 5, 6 and 7, the Bible says, Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God that He may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon Him for He cares for you. You see, before you're willing to cast all your care for Him for cares for you, you have to humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. If you're not humble, you won't take it to God. You're going to fix it. You're going to take care of it. That's why, by the way, that's why people don't get saved. Because of pride. I'm good enough. I don't need saved. I don't need to be saved. Huh? It's pride. See, it's humbling to say, I'm a sinner who deserves to die and go to hell for my sin, to be separated forever from God, and my only hope is to cry out for the mercy of God and ask Christ to save me. That it's nothing I can do, I have to rely on what He's done for me. That's humbling, my friend. But if you don't humble yourself, you'll, you'll be a proud sinner who dies and goes to hell. You have to humble yourself and trust Christ as your Savior. If Jesus, in His time of need, ran to God, how much more should you and I need to run to God in our time of need? Not run to Facebook. Run to God. Not run to your telephone. Run to God. Not run to your friends. Run to God. And tell God about it. Cast thy burden upon the Lord, and He shall sustain thee. Psalm 55, 22. He shall never suffer the righteous to be moved. Who sustains you? Cast your burden on the Lord. He'll carry, hey, He's carrying you. It doesn't matter Him. I love to tell the story about the hitchhiker with the sack of potatoes. Guy standing beside the road, got a 20-pound sack of potatoes over his shoulder, and he's hitchhiking, and the fellow stops, and he gets in and he sits down in the front seat and still has potatoes over his shoulder. And the fellow says, hey, just throw your taters in the back seat. They drive down the road, they're talking, and the driver looks over again, the guy's still got his taters. He said, hey, man, throw your taters in the back seat. And they talk a little more, looks over, and the guy still has his potatoes. He goes, hey, what's wrong with you? I said, Let, throw your taters in the back seat. You don't have to hold them over your shoulders. He goes, oh, no. It's enough you're giving me a ride. I don't want you to carry my potatoes, too. No, that's silly, isn't it? It doesn't make any difference to the car, whether he's carrying it, but it makes all difference to him whether he's still holding on to the load. Hey, why don't you cast your care on the Lord? He's carrying anyway. Say, so will it make a difference to, to him? No. Will it make a difference to you? Yes. You can, load, you can unload that. And you don't have to, it doesn't have to bother you. Cast your burden on the Lord. He shall sustain thee. He shall sustain, sustain thee. Nobody can take his place. So he ran to God first. Secondly, he understood his purpose. He understood his purpose. In verse 1, Jesus, these words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. 
Glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee. Notice verse 4. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. So wait a minute, he hadn't died on the cross yet. No, but he knew that he was. And it was just as done in his mind as if he'd already done it. He said, I've done what you sent me here to do. I'm submitting to your will. I know what my purpose was, and I'm going to fulfill my purpose. A man, listen, everybody needs a purpose. And God has a purpose for everyone. Every person who receives Christ as a Savior, God has a purpose for your life. Nobody surprised God when you got saved. Nobody, God, God didn't say, oh my, what, I never saw that coming. John Coleman got saved. Wow, I didn't know, what am I going to do with John? God, God has a plan. God has a purpose for every single believer. And having a purpose gives you stability even in uncertain times. Having a purpose will, give, will, will, will make the burdens of life bearable. Because you know what your purpose is. Someone said a man wrapped up in himself is a very small package. But you must live for something bigger than yourself. And when you live for something bigger than yourself, then your problems will seem much smaller. They won't seem even worthy of worry. What did Paul say in Romans 8 and verse 18? Paul said, I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which should be revealed in us. Hey, this, Paul said, my, my purpose of glorifying God, my purpose of bringing glory to Him, hey, uh, the problems that I go through, the sufferings I have now, that's nothing compared to the glory I'm going to have later. So I don't even count it as anything. It doesn't even bother me. And Paul had a few problems. If you read what he went through, most of us wouldn't have endured that. But he did it because of the purpose he had in his life. What's your purpose in life? Why are you here? What's your purpose, Christian? What's bigger than you that you live for? Don't get wrapped up in yourself. What, make, what would make David want to take on a giant? Why would, the, why would the little shepherd boy want to take on the guy that the whole army's afraid of? Why would he want to do that? You see, because he said, remember what his question was? Is there not a cause? He had a purpose. He had a purpose bigger than him. He said, isn't I right for him to blaspheme God? God's name's at stake. God's honor is at stake. I'm not here to let somebody badmouth God. I'm going to do something about it. I'm going to shut his mouth. And David had a cause. Is there not a purpose? Isn't there a purpose in your life? Your job, listen to me. Your, your job is not just a job to pay bills. Your job's a mission field. Say, oh, Pastor, pray I can get a different job. There's just so many lost people where I work. Why do you think you're there? You are there to be a witness to them. The light ought to shine the brightest in the darkest of situations. Make it a mission field. Same way in your neighborhood, same way with your relatives, same way with friends. Understand your purpose. He went to God first. He understood His purpose. Let me give you number three. He gave up His rights. Most, listen carefully, most stressed out people are self-centered people. Most stressed out people are self-centered people. They're stressed in part because they're trying so hard to have things their way trying to fix everything rather than let God handle it. Let God and His will prevail. You say, well, preacher, God doesn't, God doesn't want people to just walk all over you. 
Is that true? Oh, I want to be anybody's doormat. Where's, where's that chapter and verse? I think, I think I remember reading something in the Bible that if somebody comes up and hits you on the cheek, right cheek, you're supposed to turn the other one. No, most, most people, here's something interesting about that. Most people are right-handed. Some people are left-handed. How many left-handers in the room today? Yeah, one, two, three, four, five, five out of most everybody, of all the people in this room. I think there's 450 in here this morning. <laughs> huh? I'll use this fellow right here. Jose, come on. It, Jesus said, feel free to walk right on in. Okay. It said, uh, he said, if somebody, if I'm, if I'm going to hit Jose, Jose, you're facing me. You're facing me. We're gonna, if I'm going to hit him, where I'm, I disagree with him, and I'm going to hit him, where am I going to hit him most likely? What, what, what cheek is that? That's his left cheek. Jesus said if someone hits you on the right cheek. You ever, been, you ever heard what they call a sucker punch? You know what that is? That's where Jose's just standing there minding his own business. You know what I do? I come up and I go and I sucker punch and I hit him on the right cheek. Jesus said, if anybody hits you on the right cheek, turn around and say, go ahead, hit me. Hit me on the left. It's okay. Thanks. You know what you do? You give up your rights. You give up your rights. The You know, and by the way, when that happens, who wins? The guy who hit you or the one who turned around and said, go ahead? Do you, do you have to win every argument? You got to win because it's about you. Whether right or not, you want to you want to say I, I'm right. You have to have your way in the end. And by the way, God may let you win. God may let you have your way, but you'll miss His way. But you'll miss out on His way. You'll miss out on seeing what He's going to do. You see, here's the thing, Christian. Once you come to know Christ as your Savior. You know what? You know what rights you have? You know, the only the only right I had was to die and go to hell. God, I want my rights. God says, You don't want your rights. You want my mercy and you want my grace. You don't want your rights. And all of a sudden we we want we want mercy and we want grace, but then we get saved, and you know what we do? We say, Okay, now I want my rights back. Now I want to live by my rights again. God says, no, give up the rights. You know, it's hard to have an argument with someone who won't argue back. You know, they, they, well, it takes, you ever heard this, the expression, it takes two to tango? I'm not sure what tango is. I think Bob Wallace said it was a dance. But you know what? It takes two to tangle as well. It takes two to have an argument. You know, when you hold on to a certain right, and you hold on so tight, and you grip it, and you're unwilling to yield, then you open the door for people to control you. They can buy you. They can put limits on you. They control you. Think about Paul. Paul, we don't like you, so we're going to stone you. Paul would say, really? Well, that happened to me once before, and they thought I was dead, but really all I was was caught up to heaven for a little bit. 
ended up getting up the next day and kept on preaching. Well, all right, never mind. We'll throw you in prison. Oh, really? Could it be the one where I had witnessed that prison guard last time I was in? Because I sure would like to check on him and see how he's doing. Well, here's what we'll do. We'll just kill you then. Well, that would settle my dilemma. Because I've kind of been in a, in a dilemma whether to stay here on earth or whether to depart and go to heaven, which is far better. And I'm sure they'd look at him and say, man, it's no use trying to argue with this guy. It's no use trying to get to him. Having, listen, having to have your way all the time is pretty stressful. Having to have your way all the time is pretty stressful. You'd be surprised how much stress you could leave out of your life if you just would let God have His way. We, we live in the society of opinions. No matter what happens, anywhere, anytime, any place, there's a radio station that's going to come on and say, call us and tell us what you think. Why do I have to think anything? Why do you need my opinion? And if you don't agree with my opinion, we'll, we'll have an argument about it. That's where we are in our country. It's awful stressful, isn't it? Jesus yielded His rights to the Father. He let God's will be done. He went to God first. He understood His purpose. He gave up His rights. Lastly, He gave Himself away. He gave Himself away. There's givers and there's takers in life. Takers are always looking to get something. And by the way, it doesn't have to be material things. It could be attention, respect, special privileges. That's takers. Givers are always looking to contribute something. The problem in our country is today we have a lot of takers and not enough givers. There are a lot of consumers, but not many contributors. Someone said, that there's a poem that was written, are you a lifter or a leaner? There are two kinds of people on earth today. Two kinds of people, no more, I say. Not the good and the bad, for it's well understood. The good are half bad and the bad are half good. Not the happy or sad, for in the swift flying years bring each man his laughter, each man his tears. Not the rich or the poor, for to count a man's wealth, you must know the state of his conscience and his health. Not the humble and proud, for in life's busy span, who puts on vain airs is not counted a man. No, the two kinds of people on earth I mean are the people who lift and the people who lean. Wherever you go, you'll find the world's masses are ever divided into these two classes. And strangely enough, you'll find two, I mean, there's only one lifter to 20 who lean. Which class are you? Are you easing the load of the overtaxed lifters who toil down the road? Or are you a leaner who lets others bear your portion of worry and labor and care? Leaners are stressed because they're always looking for whom else to lean on and to take from. Find peace and relief from pressure the way Jesus did. He said, For the Son of Man is come, came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, and to give His life a ransom for many. And Jesus is saying, Fellas, I did what God wanted me to do, and now I'm leaving. Give it your best, and then leave it there. Don't stress about it. Don't obsess about it. Don't look back. Move on. Give yourself away. Live your life for others. When you're stressed, when you're feeling... Look, get your mind off yourself. And do something for somebody else. Jesus found great peace. John 17, before he went to the cross. He turned himself to God. He remembered his purpose. He gave up his rights. And he gave himself away for others.
Ultimately, it was for us when He gave Himself on the cross as a payment for our sin that we might have eternal life. If you've never received Him as your Savior, accept Him as your Savior today. Let's pray, shall we? Father, we bow before You now this morning. Thank You, Jesus, for Your prayer here in John 17. Thank You, Lord, for Your example to us of how You handled a very stressful situation. And Lord, I pray that these steps that you took would be steps that each of us would desire to take when we are under pressure. We feel the stress at times. We feel the pressure at times of this world and the surroundings in which we live. Lord, I pray we would take the steps today to be able to handle that stress in a way that would honor and glorify you. Oh, help us today to be doers of the word and not hearers only. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. I'm going to finish the prayer in just a moment. But I wonder this morning, just between you and God right now, I wonder, first of all, how many folks in the room today would be, Pastor, I realized that Christ died for me when he died on the cross. And there's a time in my life when I knew that I was a sinner and I, I was a sinner who deserved to die and go to hell. But Jesus Christ died for me on the cross. He was buried. He rose again the third day. And I heard the good news that if I called on Jesus and asked Him to be my Savior, He'd save me and give me eternal life. And Pastor, I called on Jesus and He gave me the gift of eternal life. And Pastor, here's my hand as a testimony. I know that I'm saved this morning. Would you slip your hand up? Say, Pastor, I know that I'm saved. All right. You may put them down. So somebody here today would say, Pastor, I don't know that for sure. I don't know for certain if I died, I'd go to heaven. I don't know that I've ever been saved. Would you pray for me today? Would you slip your hand up and I could pray for you? I don't think I saw anybody's hand that didn't go up the first time. The message to believers, it was how do you handle the stress? Do you go to God? Do you, do you yield your rights? Will you, will you give yourself for others? Will you handle it the way Jesus did? Will you remember there's a purpose for your life? Will you live for something bigger than you? Bigger than yourself? I wonder how many Christians here today would say, Preacher, God spoke to my heart today. The Spirit of God stopped at my seat. And it's helped me in dealing with pressures and the stresses of life. Pastor, pray for me this morning. Will you slip your hand up, Christian? Say, God spoke to me today, preacher. God bless you. You may put them down. In a moment, I'll pray, and we'll have our invitation. If you're here today, and God has spoken to your heart, now you ought to speak to Him. You respond to Him at the invitation, and you just come and kneel at the altar, spend some time praying to Him. If you're here today, and you're saved, and you've never been scripturally baptized, you ought to come and say, Pastor, I'm saved, but I need to follow the Lord in baptism today. We have everything you need to follow the Lord in baptism. You just be obedient to Him. If you're saved and you're scripturally baptized and you believe this is where you ought to belong, you ought to come and say, Pastor, we think God would have us be members at Bible Baptist Church. And we'd welcome you into the fellowship of our church. Whatever it is that God's dealing with your heart about, I simply want you to be obedient to Him this morning. Heavenly Father, thank You for speaking to hearts today. Thank You, Lord, for these hands that have been uplifted and maybe others that weren't uplifted, but you dealt with them nonetheless. And I pray, Lord, that holy decisions be made for you now in these next few moments at these altars. That each person would do what you're telling them to do in their heart. May your will be done in every life this morning. In Jesus' name. With your heads bowed, you stand to your feet. As you stand to your feet, the pianist will play. As she plays, Bob's going to sing. God has spoken to your heart. Respond to him this morning. You have longed for sweet peace and for faith to increase and have earnestly, fervently prayed. But you cannot have rest or be perfectly blessed until all on the altar is laid. Is your all on the altar of sacrifice laid? Your heart does the 
spirit control you can only be blessed and have peace and sweet rest as you yield him your body and soul would you walk with the lord in the light of his word and have peace and contentment always you must do his sweet will to be free from all ill on the altar your all you must lay is your all on the altar of sacrifice laid your heart does the spirit control you can only be blessed and have peace and sweet rest as you yield him your body and soul oh we never can know what the lord will bestow of the blessings for which we have prayed till our body and soul he doth fully control and are all on the altar is laid sing it with him is your all on the, the altar, altar of sacrifice, sacrifice laid your heart does a spirit control you can only be blessed and have peace and sweet rest as you yield him your body and soul go ahead and be seated if you will and, um, we're glad to have Brenda Mann coming this morning uh, Brenda Wow, when did you start coming, Brenda? December 1st. And uh, she started coming. This is an amazing, amazing transformation that has taken place in Brenda's life. And she, by her own testimony, she telling me Friday evening, uh, she was really not, she was past discouragement. She was into depression. And uh, staying in her room at home, 10 by 10 room, didn't want to see anybody, didn't talk to anybody. But she started listening to the radio. And just like Brother Tom, she said, I think I need to come and see that church. And she started coming. And God has done an amazing work in her life. And now faithful all the services, helping out on Friday nights in Reformers Unanimous. And just, just doing a, just God's changed her life tremendously. And her family sees it and others see it and uh, been on had been on all kinds of pills and things, doctors, and I think she's gotten off most of those, and uh, God's just setting her free. It's just amazing. And uh, she wants to follow the Lord in baptism and become a member of the church today, so that's great, isn't it? And uh, that's exciting stuff. Congratulations, Brenda. God bless you. Kay will take you down and get you set uh, for baptism, and we'll get ready to baptize Brenda this morning. That's, that's wonderful. Praise the Lord. All right. But the Bible leads you in some hymns, and uh, we'll get ready to baptize. Well, let's start with number 277 this morning. 277. I am so glad that our Father in heaven tells us the love in the book he has given. On that first together, I am so glad that our Father in heaven tells of his love in the book he has given. Wonderful things in the Bible I see. This is the dearest that Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves even me. Amen. Brother Pete? 411. 411. Be uh, thinking of your favorite hymn. Maybe something we don't sing very often. We'll sing 411 and then we'll, we'll get yours, Bobby. 411. Look and live. I have a message from the Lord. Hallelujah. The message unto you. 
Number was it? Two hundred seventy four. Two eighty four. All right. Just a closer walk with thee. I am weak, but thou art strong. Jesus, keep me from all wrongs. Let's sing that first together. I am weak, but thou art strong. Number five, zero. There is power, wonder working power in the blood. Amen. Number five, zero. Would you be free from the burden of sin? On that first, would you be free from the burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you are evil of victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. All right. Brother Danny? Number 10. Number 10. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have Brenda Mann. Brenda, upon a public profession of your faith in Christ as your Savior, and in obedience to his command, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried in the likeness of Jesus' death, and raised in the likeness of his resurrection. Amen. Amen. And the servant said, Master, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. All right, 188. Let's go to 188. This is one we haven't sung in quite some time. 
but it's a fun one. 188, we're going to sing the whole thing. You know this song? All right. <laughs> Happiness is the Lord. Happiness is to know the Savior living a life within his favor, having a change in my behavior. Happiness is the Lord. Happiness is a new creation. by a heavy burden neath a load of guilt and shame. He touched me on that first shackled by a The longer I serve him, the sweeter. stand together shall we hey let me encourage you to be back tonight okay even if you normally don't come on sunday night come tonight okay you will get a blessing these groups are always great great service great fellowship tonight so uh be back this evening all right let's have a wonderful time together look forward to it and let's pray shall we father thank you for this morning thank you for your goodness to us and for your blessing it's been good to be in the house of the lord today Thank you for Brenda and for her decision to follow you in baptism today. And thank you for changing her life. Yes. Lord, allowing her now to be a blessing to others. And Lord, continue to work in her life and the life of her family members who see the transformation that's taken place. And Lord, may they soon come to know Christ as their Savior as well. Lord, give us a good afternoon. Prepare our hearts for what you have for us this evening. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by His blood. Join us with Jesus as we travel this God. For I'm a part of the family, the family of God. 
Amen. You are dismissed. We'll see you tonight.